Well, this debate cannot and should not happen in a vacuum. We all live in the real world, and in the real world, bad things happen in Russia. The opposition leaders, non-Kremlin staged politicians, are threatened, intimidated, and bullied on a daily basis. There are laws passed to ensure that organization of a new political movement opposing the regime is extremely difficult and expensive, and those who disobey are severely punished. This past Christmas vacation, my colleagues behind me and I were on the phone to prominent Russian politicians, journalists, and LGBT campaigners. And one after another, they have all refused to come because they were either banned from leaving their country, they were too afraid to speak on this particular motion, or because they did not want to anger Vladimir Putin on the, night of his, on the eve of his largest PR project, the Sochi Olympics. The free press is also virtually non-existent in Russia, with most major TV channels and newspapers being under the state control. A pro those journalists who are afraid to speak out often end up badly under Putin's watch. A prominent journalist, Anna Politkovska, who was unafraid to write about corruption of the regime, was brutally murdered outside her house in 2006, on the, on the day of Putin's birthday. Now lastly, the absolute corruption in Russia is unbearable, which leads to many talented scientists, thinkers and entrepreneurs leaving their motherland. The people making the big decisions in Russia today are the ones who, through the lottery of life, happened to work with Vladimir Putin in the KGB, were neighbours with him in St. Petersburg, or were university champs with him back in the days. Not only that, but the organised crime has penetrated, has penetrated the society. Imagine the state where the police, the secret services, the prosecutors, the courts and the organised crime all operate under the same domain. Just, just imagine if Scotland Yard, the MI5, the Crown Prosecution Office and the London gangs all operated under one big conspiracy. Well, this is the unfortunate reality of Russia today. Well, however, no matter how difficult it is, ladies and gentlemen, we on side proposition will argue that on a balance, Vladimir Putin has been good for Russia. And tonight, before you, I'll deliver three main points. The first one being that under Vladimir Putin, the living standards and real disposable incomes have risen significantly. And it is therefore unsurprising that over the last 14 years, Putin has remained number one politician in Russia because people vote with their pockets and when it comes to business, Vladimir Putin has delivered economic improvement. Secondly, the Russian national pride has been restored under Putin. A nation once demoralized in the early 90s by the chaos, the rule of a select group of oligarchs and an alcoholic president is now standing firm on its feet and most Russians rightly credit Putin for that. Thirdly, I'll explain that although we in the West in the West might not consider Putin's despotic regime um, a perfectly democratic one, it simply does not matter what we consider. What matters is whether Russian people and on the whole have been better off and tonight we'll show you that they have. But before I commence my speech, it is my duty and honour to introduce to you the members of your opposition. So as the first speaker we have Sir Roderick Lyne, KCMG, he's a retired British diplomat and a former Her Majesty's ambassador to Moscow. Uh, I'm so told that KCMG apparently stands for Kindly Call Me God. Um, <laughs> according to the ever-accurate Wikipedia, Sir Roderick famously refused to attend Marlborough College, uh, and I quote, because there were no doors in the lavatories, and instead intended Eton, followed by a history degree from Leeds University. Your second speaker, Richard Sackway, is a professor of Russian and European politics at the University of Kent. Professor Sackway is a leading British scholar in the field of Russian contemporary and Soviet politics. He had published over a dozen books on Putin, Russia, and Soviet Union. Furthermore, as a recipient of British Council scholarship, he spent a year at Moscow State University at the end of Brezhnev's 18-year rule, and it therefore would be particularly fascinating to hear his thoughts um, on the parallels that are so often drawn between Putin and Brezhnev. Lastly, your final speaker for opposition tonight is Dr. Alexander Goldfarb. After graduating with a biochemistry degree from Moscow State University, he worked as a researcher until he fled Soviet Union in 1975. Then Mr. Goldfarb earned his PhD from Weizmann Institute of Israel and continued work as research. As Russia became more open, Dr. Goldfarb was heavily involved in charitable work under the patronage of Soros Foundation and was heavily, and was close to both Boris Berezovsky and Alexander Litvinenko. Madam President, these are your opposition speakers tonight and they're most welcome. Before I begin, let me define this motion we're debating tonight. We're debating 
that Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, as his full name stands in Russian, has been good for his country. We're not here to debate his record in upholding to principles of human rights, we're not here to debate his KGB past, and we're not here to debate his authoritarian leadership style. We're here to debate whether Putin has been good for Russia and its people, and I very much hope so that our opposition speakers will not divert from the motion tonight. Now to my first point, that under Vladimir Putin, the living standards and real disposable income in the country have risen dramatically. Let us flash back to 1998. The country had to default on its foreign debt and was begging IMF for another loan. By 1999, 40% of the Russian population lived behind the poverty line. Millions relied on their own agricultural produce simply to survive. The debt to GDP ratio stood at 110%, an issue which most Western democracies face today. The inflation stood at 30%, and the nation's currency, the Russian rubble, was virtually unconvertible. The unemployment was at 15%. However, not everyone who was um, had a job was lucky enough to be paid in time. Even if they did, those salaries were barely enough to survive on. Fast forward to 2014. What we see? Well, the poverty is down by a factor of four, from 40 to 11.1% according to World Bank. Compare this with the US Census Bureau figures for the current US poverty, which stands at 16%. Not bad. The GDP to debt ratio is down at 12%, a colossal reduction from 110 in, uh, in 1999. The real average wages are up by 2.6 times after inflation. Unemployment is at 5%, down from 15, and wages, pensions, and benefits are paid in time. Friends, the list can go on, but you simply cannot deny that Putin has a, had a massive positive impact on Russia and made the real progress for, for, in the living standards for the majority of, of the people of his country. You don't need to be a genius to see why he consistently remained number one politician in Russia. People do go and vote for him because they, they're better off. It's as simple as that. He gives them stability, social guarantees, and a sense of pride, which brings, me, which brings me to my second point, which is that the Russian national pride has been restored under Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin came to power at a very difficult moment. He inherited a hugely inefficient planned economy, which was not ready to, which was not ready for market, open market type operations. The oil rich, predominantly Muslim region of Tatarstan, 1500 miles east of Moscow was planning to de on declaring independence. Not only that, but the terrorists of the southern Russian region of Chechnya also posed a massive threat, which culminated in the 1999 attack on Dagestan. And nobody, I repeat, nobody in Russia paid any federal tax. The country was literally on the brink of a civil war. Fifteen years later, Russians have something to feel proud about. President Putin has just out for ex-president Obama on Syria with his friend Bashar al-Assad enjoying the reins of power as we speak here tonight. He gave the two fingers to you diplomats who were left flat-footed after his protege, President Yanukovych of Ukraine, walked out of the EU association deal, deal and turned to Russia. These things might not necessarily be liked by us here, but they're good for Russia and its interest, and that is what we're debating here tonight. But let's turn to history for a second. The Slovaks started populating the area around Moscow in early 1000s. Then, for nearly 900 years, Russians lived under the rule of Tsars who had the supreme power. Then, in 1917, the Bolsheviks came and Russians were subject to a further 75 years of communism, 74 uh, to be exact. It is only in 1991 that Russians have started enjoying certain freedoms we here take for granted, and it is foolish to expect them to be democratic straight away. Such transitions from authoritarian to democratic style of government take a very long time, as they certainly did here in England. It took us almost 100 years from the 1834 Great Reform Act to 1928, when all women were finally granted the right to vote. Many therefore believe that Russians are not yet ready for democracy, and it will take at least several generations to build it into them. Russia is a harsh place, and Russians want to see a strong leader who will guide them through the storms of life. For the moment, this leader happens to be Putin. At the end of the day, it simply does not matter what we think about Putin personally. Neither mine nor your opinion, ladies and gentlemen, matters. What matters is whether Russia and the majority of Russians have been better off. And I believe that tonight we made a compelling case that they have. But let's make no mistake. 
Let's be clear about this. Vladimir Putin is no innocent man. There is a reason he speaks fluent German. The reason being he was posted by the KGB to East Germany to spy there. This man supports certain regimes that at best can be called undemocratic and at worst butcher-like. If you judge a man by his friends, his friendship with Silva Berlusconi tells it all. <laughs> Putin is widely accused of cheating in general elections to ramp up his already high score from 50 to 68 percent. Our gay brothers and sisters in Russia are humiliated on a daily basis. The total corruption and weak legal system burden both ordinary Russians and aspiring entrepreneurs. Things for those living in Russia today are very tough. However, Russia of 1999 and Russia of 2014 are incomparable. The living standards are up, the real disposable income is up, the birth rate and life expectancy is up. What's down? Well, the unemployment is down. The national debt is down. Poverty is down. To deny the fact that Putin has had a significant, a significant positive impact on Russia is foolish, to say the least. Yes, the man isn't perfect, and perhaps you and I would like to see someone with a better track record to upholding, uh, for upholding to principles of human rights and democracy. <coughs> However, he's done a pretty good job, and on the whole, has been good for Russia. So, when you walk through the door tonight, I hope you will call upon your reason and ignore your emotions when you judge Vladimir Putin. Please give him a fair judgment. The man has been overwhelmingly good for Russia, and he deserves certain credit for that. Thank you very much.